We're with Michael Robbins. He is the director and Crow principal investigator at Arab Barometer. Michael, thank you so much for making time for us. Thank you, Natasha. It's great to be here. Michael, it's it's incredible. You guys completed this survey on October the 6th, the day before the Hamas attacks on Israel, the day before the war was declared. Give us a sense of how ordinary Gazans looked at Hamas and their Hamas-led government on October the 6th. Sure. So Hamas was very had low, very low levels of trust uh, in advance. I mean, essentially, they had uh, Gaza was a very difficult place to live. People are very frustrated at their life. Three quarters had missed a meal in the past month, and so there was a lot of struggle going on. And it seems that many of them blame the Hamas government. When we asked, "Do you have trust in the Hamas government?" Forty four percent, the plurality of respondents said simply they had no trust at all. In total, just 29 percent said they had confidence in Hamas. And if we asked about their preferred party, just a, just over a quarter, 27 percent said that they had um, that this was their favorite party. So overall, we saw very low levels of support for Hamas. And why was there such low levels of trust? So one of the big issues that we see is corruption, that there had been talk of, of dealing with corruption. But still, 72 percent of Gazans said corruption was a major problem in, in their government. Um, many people were also short of food, as I said. There was also uh, a lot of different challenges that they were facing in daily life. And so what we found is when we asked people who's to blame for this, that the, the most common response we received was not the Israeli sanctions, but was actually the Hamas government's mismanagement. The second one was inflation, which has been uh, very, very bad in the Gaza Strip, as it has in many places around the world. And then the third was the sanctions. So it does seem that before this conflict, citizens were having a lot of trouble in their daily life and were most likely to blame the Hamas government. I want to dig deeper on that first point you said, Michael, because I think it's so important for people to understand who may not have been following this conflict prior to October 7th. The fact that most Gazans that you spoke with laid more blame on Hamas mismanagement than on Israeli sanctions and on Israeli what some have described as occupation of the territory. Dig into that. What was the interaction like by the government of Hamas with the ordinary Gazan? I, I think that the, there are many challenges. Hamas was uh, essentially saying that they were going to take care of the ordinary people when they won the election in 2006. They were promising many things that really did not get delivered. And so it was surprising to us. I think this was actually the most surprising finding in the entire survey. But what we do see is that citizens, I think, were really looking at their daily life, that the blockade had been in, in place for many years, and that certainly Hamas was, was you know, part of the issue that was, was leading to that. So as they focused on their daily life, um, I, there were other issues as well, is that those who had a slightly higher level of income were more likely to trust the Hamas government. In some sense, there was a corruption that people who were connected, who had links to the Hamas government, seemed to be more supportive of it, those who could uh, access some of the benefits perhaps some of the corruption that stemmed from uh, the way that Hamas is running Gaza. So certainly, I think, as people saw this, as they interacted with other citizens or other Palestinians living in Gaza who, who were engaged with the Hamas government, certainly the frustration of, of the fact that Hamas had not improved their lives and the fact that those who were connected to the Hamas government had a better situation was certainly frustrating to the majority of the, the population. How do you believe, and I'm sure it's difficult to measure in the middle of a war, but how do you think those perceptions, those that sense of frustration, lack of trust with Hamas has shifted or gained at all as a result of the war? So it's very difficult to say in this context. Certainly, we've never seen something like this in Gaza, uh, the tragedy that is, is befalling so many, civilian, or so many civilians there. But what we have seen in the past and past research that we've done is when Israel increases the, the restrictions in the blockade, strengthens the blockade, or undertakes military action, uh, against uh, Gaza that has been much less than this. We have seen a bump in support for Hamas. That what we typically see, I think, is my enemy's enemy is my friend. So if, if people are suffering from Israeli bombing or from a change in the sanctioned regime, they do reward uh, Israel's enemy, Hamas. So it does seem that when in the past Israel has done this, at least in the, the public opinion of Gaza, it has been counterproductive that this strengthens Hamas. Certainly that is possible now. I think given the devastation, given the frustration, and given the number of deaths that we've seen, the people, even though Hamas, in a sense, uh, you know, with their horrific attacks, started this most recent round of, uh, of, of conflict with Israel, that they may have actually had an increase in support because, in a sense, they are the resistance. They are the ones who are, who are at least saying that they're standing up against this military attack. So it's possible it's gone up. Of course, given the scale, 
given that people do know that Hamas started this, it's possible it went down. But based on past research, our expectation is that probably Hamas would be more popular at this point. Hmm. You know, we've made a conscious choice at CBC News, as have many news organizations. I'm sure you've noticed it, Michael, that when we categorize this war, we describe it as the Israel-Hamas war, not the Israel-Gaza war, not the Israeli-Palestinian war. This is specifically against Hamas, and yet it is ordinary Palestinians who are getting the worst brunt of this war. Um, is that perception clear? Is that part of the reporting? Just talk to me about how uh, the Arab barometer views this story. So I, I think that what we focus on is, is the general population. We really want to give voice to people in places that they don't have much voice. If we look at, at Gaza before um, the, these attacks, what we saw was that citizens said that they had no, the, major, the majority said that they did not have the right to speak freely. Majority said they didn't have the right to protest. They were really under a system that was essentially authoritarian, was a dictatorship led by Hamas. So in a way, what we want to do is try and work around that to give voice to that. And I think that what's unfortunate now is that given conditions, we are unable to actually go and give voice to how they're feeling today. With the cutoff, with the electricity being cut off, people cannot charge their cell phones. There's no ability to do internet surveys as a result either. And we can't go face to face. This is what we normally do to give people privacy in their own home. So we would really like to go back, be able to understand how citizens are, or how Palestinians are viewing this. But at the time, we can't. And so it is a bit uh, challenging. What we can do is say beforehand, you know, there was a lot of suffering happening. Certainly, the scale of that has gone up uh, astronomically given the conditions on the ground in Gaza. We've all seen it on TV. And so it is. It is very sad that the people, the team that actually carried out this work is, is under immense suffering as well. And so a lot of ordinary Gazans, because of the actions of Hamas and the, the response of the, um, the Israeli government, are just suffering immensely. And that's really uh, something that we want to make sure uh, is, is clear, because this is a population that had no uh, real confidence in Hamas beforehand. Based on your research before the war and based on what you've seen happen now, what do you think ordinary Gazans want once this war comes to an end? So I, I think that Gazans have always wanted what most people want, which is the ability to live freely, have enough to feed their families and, and these type of, of things. It is difficult to project. What we saw before was that uh, the majority favored a two-state solution when we gave them a, the, the three realistic options. About one in 10 favored a one-state solution, one in 10 favored a confederation, and about 20% favored some form of armed resistance. So again, the majority of the Palestinian population wanted peace. It's really difficult to understand what that would be now. Certainly, uh, it, it isn't really a time where I would expect people to, to really think that the, you know any of these solutions, these peaceful solutions, are possible. Once that ends, I mean, we we do hope to go back, try and understand what that is. But certainly, with the destruction we've seen in the northern part of Gaza, with what seems to potentially be coming in the southern part of Gaza, it's very very difficult to project. It does not seem like the Arab countries around have any desire to come in and, and really. Um, do the, the kind of policing, do the other pieces that would be necessary to rebuild the state. It's difficult to see the Palestinian Authority coming in on the back of the Israeli invasion and having any legitimacy. So certainly, uh, what is the future? Uh, what Gazans would want, I think, is very muddy. It's, you know, they essentially want to be able to live their lives, but how we could actually um, see that come to fruition is, is extremely difficult in these circumstances. Michael Robbins, thank you so much for sharing your research with us. Thank you, Natasha.